Hi friends. My nephew was born in a hurricane. The night that Ida made its way to New York City, causing flash flooding, displacing almost 300 families, and drowning at least 36 people, mostly immigrants, in their basement apartments, my dear friends and pseudo-sisters were entirely unaware from their windowless hospital room while their kid made an early entrance into this world. This one. The one that it feels like it's ready to be done with us. And I got really sad and really scared. I don't think I'm alone in feeling my anxiety about climate change pitching upward right now. As I'm writing, we're under another flash flood warning in New York. More people will lose their homes. More toxic flood water will pour into our subway system, stranding people from getting to their jobs or getting home from them. This year, the grimness really set in. Over 30 named storms in the Atlantic, more than 6 million acres of wildfires. I mean, you saw those memes about how 2020 was the hottest summer of our lives, but also the coolest summer of the rest of our lives. And we'll get to that meme later. But it's clear that my generation and younger all feel a general despair about climate. And on top of that, a helplessness now that we know that like recycling our plastic bottles and buying a Prius isn't enough of a solution. There's this fatalistic tone I hear a lot about how our actions don't matter. This is all corporations' fault and they're not gonna change. Climate disaster isn't some faraway storm off the coast. It's here and it's already flooded our basements. So guess I'll die. I don't find it surprising that millennials and Gen Z are prone to this kind of thinking because we carry $500 billion of student debt. We have the lowest home ownership rates of any generation. Half of us are doing worse off financially than our parents were at our age. It's hard enough for us to imagine or plan for a future as it is. We don't have retirement accounts. We just have half jokes about how the world will end before we get old enough to retire anyway. It's kind of the hallmark of like the quarter life crisis that you don't let yourself bother with all these unattainable dreams. So once you hit 25 or 30, you're kind of surprised to still be alive. Like, you had no ideas or vision about what would come next, and that sends you into a spiral. Same thing for climate. In her book, A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety, the environmental studies professor, Dr. Sarah Jaquette Ray, talks about leading her students through an exercise called Vision Change Action. It'll be familiar to community organizers among you, but it's where you imagine what a positive future looks like, then decide what change needs to happen in order to get there and then come up with the actions you need to take to bring about that change. But her class couldn't get past step one. They couldn't imagine a positive future at all. I think that's what turned my climate anxiety up to 11 when my nephew was born, because like me, whatever. I've been had the crisis about my own future and now I've got my nihilist memes to keep me warm. But this kid, he's gonna have flash flood season for his whole life and he had nothing to do with this. And suddenly, where no real concept of a future existed, time whipped wide open and it did not look great. Now, I don't mean to as a father of daughters this, like I don't think that knowing a baby has made me more empathetic or more connected to humanity or less selfish or whatever people like to say about breeding. But as an aunt of nephews, I think that it has made me better at like imagining the concept of time? I'm prone to the standard millennial blurriness of what life looks like after, I don't know, two weeks from now. But this thing has happened more recently where I can sort of imagine myself as a secondary character in the life of this kid, teaching him how to skateboard or going to his graduation. It makes it a little more possible for me to imagine what it's like to grow older. It makes it seem like 2050 or 2030 aren't fake years they made up for sci-fi movies. In a way, it made all my worst fears about what we're in for, you know, climate-wise, more real too. I should stop and warn you here that I'm not trying to replace this kind of despair with some like, breathy voiced, lens flary, impotent vision of hope. I know we started with like a baby being born, but we're gonna zag. Not at hope, but maybe at realism? Something that actual climate scientist Miriam Nielsen has told me when I doom spiral at her is that, you know, the idea that we're on the brink of human extinction isn't true, or at least not in the kind of way that we joke about it, you know, to keep from constantly weeping. This isn't an asteroid wiping out the dinosaurs style apocalypse. As climate scientist Dr. Kate Marvel writes often, there is no scientific support for inevitable doom. Which means, I guess, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how deep into mentally unwell TikTok you are, many of us are going to live through this. We actually do have a future. 
So we have to figure out what that's going to mean. It might mean what the science communicator Dr. Britt Ray describes in her newsletter, Gen Dread, as living in the role of prospective survivor, which means now that we've envisioned how we all might perish, we have to get better at imagining how we might survive, how we might need to adapt, how we might need to live with flood seasons and fire seasons without giving up the fight to prevent them from getting even worse. We all need to get better at imagining the future. It doesn't have to be a rosy one. We don't need to act like it's all gonna be okay because it's not, but it's all gonna be and many of us are gonna be there. Dr. Marvel writes that climate change isn't a cliff, it's a slope and it's one that we're already well headed down. But how steep it is, how fast we fall down it, whether it flattens out, hell, whether things turn back around again, a thing that I recently learned could be possible in our lifetimes, so you know, fuck that meme. All of what the future looks like will be shaped by the things that we are collectively, as humans, doing now. We decide how dystopian that future will be. We decide now exactly what we have to survive. We decide what kind of communal climate adaptation skills I'm gonna have to learn so that I can teach them to my nephew. So what can we do? I'll share one last thing that I found helpful from A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety. Both the idea that you are powerless and the idea that you must do something uniquely heroic are wrong. I think spending some time with these ideas, reframing how we see our future, understanding this prospective survivor role and the responsibilities that come with it is part of the process. That's something that Dr. Jaquette Ray is very clear about in her book. Dealing with the emotional impacts of climate change isn't something you can skip over if you wanna be effective. So I'm leaving a bunch of links below to resources that I found helpful in writing this video, and I encourage you to leave more in the comments. Also in comments, are you experiencing climate anxiety? Do you have trouble imagining the future? How are you dealing with all of this now? I'll see you next week. Bye.